fesker ma is faltje can hula dinye tap alive er schon hier in nog a hier op gehaan in you and this is a very special night because it's the first time that we've met together for two years i think it was well two years in march since we last had a komenyechtri talk and since we all met each other in public so this is really good to see everyone even although the weather is so awful um, and Ian's talk as we all know aspects of the religious history of Bach second part has been long delayed so thank you Ian we've made it at last and we're also very grateful to Bach Free Church for the use of the hall tonight and as you all know Ian's talk was going to be delivered in Gaelic but because of COVID restrictions there are problems with using the headphones for the simultaneous translation um, hygiene wise so there was a last minute decision two nights ago that the talk would be more inclusive for everyone if it was in English and Ian thank you for agreeing to that uh, at such short notice um, there will be no teas as we usually have because again we weren't very sure about um, the COVID restrictions but hopefully at our next meetings there will be tea and buns and time to talk so with no further ado I'd like to introduce Ian and we look forward to part two of aspects of the religious history of Bach. Thank you very much. Thank you Anna. And, uh, I thought it was appropriate before we start uh, if we maybe had a word of prayer and I, I'm going to ask um, Carl McLean if he'll uh, just say a word of prayer for Carl just now before we start. <coughs> Lord our God, we thank you again this evening for your goodness to us in sparing us and providing for us and providing this venue for us this evening. Give thanks, O oh Lord, as we look back over the years and we think of how good the Lord has been to us in the history not only of this church but of the history of the Lord's cause in our island and already we heard that uh, through Ian's first lecture we give thanks O oh Lord for your goodness to us and the preservation of the gospel for the, prov the, pro the provision of the gospel the gospel came to these islands and we give thanks O oh Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ was preached and preached with power many years ago we give thanks, O oh Lord, for the memory that we have of those who were witnesses for you and those who stood out in our communities and were renowned for the fact that they followed Christ and the fact that people knew of them, like they did of the disciples of old, that they had been with Jesus. But when we come to look up into the history of our church, we reflect upon those that we met on the road and those that we can remember from past years those who were uh, companions with us when we were but young and uh, prayed for us and we are witnesses here this evening many of those who professed faith who, who, who were prayed for those uh, of our generation who prayed for us and we give thanks that the prayer of the righteous never ceases although they are gone their prayers are still a memorial to them and I would ask that you would bless us all here this evening and as we reflect upon your goodness to us in this parish that we would above everything else look to the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ as our great Saviour, as our Redeemer, as our friend. Bless Ian as he speaks to us, give him liberty 
and we ask that you bless the society, the historical society as well. We give thanks for those who give their time in their community for different things. And we give especially thanks to the historical society. We ask that you would be with them in the future, in their future plans, that uh, you would bless them. Bless all others. Remember those who would be here but can't, but through illness or maybe age or what or even the inclement weather. We ask that you would remember them and bless them. Bless us all together. Wash us all in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask it for his sake. Amen. Thank you, Colin. When I agreed to deliver a talk for the common Echtri initially, uh, the topic I thought would be appropriate was aspects of the um, development of Christianity in relation to the district of Bach. Um, as I was very aware of the fact that uh, others before me, um, notably uh, Reverend Murdo Macaulay, and also Neil Murray had um, given a very uh, good account of a number of things to do with the, the um, development of Christianity in this area. So um, I thought at the, at the time, well, uh, maybe I could develop some aspect of that. In, initially, I foolishly thought, assumed that I could do something in an hour that would be sufficient to cover the subject and then that would be my bit done and uh, that would be it. Well, alas, my last attempt uh, has proved to me that uh, what we have here is indeed a mammoth, a huge task. Now, sure, before I start on that, um, at the last uh, meeting we had, which is some time ago now, of course, uh, there were three really good things, Re three really good things on that evening. Um, the first was the very warm and uh, kind introduction I was given by Anna Nienmeck, Anna Tucker. Um, and then there was the brilliant, and I'm, I'm serious about this bit, uh, the brilliant um, translation at the Hankerhut done by um, uh, Tara McBurk Smith, Norman Smith Jr. And uh, I only listened to that only just recently to see how many of the faults that I had um, displayed in the last one that I could maybe iron out uh, this time round. But uh, as I listened to it, I thought to myself, it's amazing how he managed to do what he did. Uh, it's a very, I had never done it, but I can imagine it must be horrendous trying to keep, listen, I don't know how you do it without having two sets of ears actually, um, how you could possibly listen to somebody saying what they're saying and they're, you're following the trend of it and at the same time you're translating it into language that those who are in front of you will understand. So uh, you've got two things going on at the one time and uh, I only, at the end I was saying, well, I only have the, the utmost um, admiration for uh, Norman, Norman Buck, Thomas Buck Smith. Now, on that, before I forget, I heard recent, just the other day, I heard that um, Taramot Moore, his father, was uh, unwell at the moment. And uh, so we remember, we remember him at the moment and hopefully we'll, we'll be hearing better things uh, in the near future. But that was, that was the second thing. The first thing was uh, a really uh, kind introduction by Anna. And then there was Taramot's um, uh, brilliant, I would have said, uh, in the, um, translation. And then we had a very kind and um, warm conclusion from Kanyaf Moore from Kenny McKeever. So these three things were good. These were the good things to, about it. Uh, the, the things that weren't so good are going to be hopefully ironed out a wee bit tonight. And one of them is uh, to tackle less, to tackle less because the subject is so huge. Um, so I thought, uh, well, I'll take it maybe so far tonight 
Sie har erfaring i det andre. And uh, who knows who will take it on from there? Um, uh, as far as I can see, uh, it could go on as a series of things uh, for quite a while. So something you, you might think about, certainly in the future. So uh, let me try to explain first of all then what the task could or should break down into. Uh, in one sense, <laughs> in one sense, the matter goes back to the Garden of Eden, because that's where it all started. And the patriarchs uh, were thinking there of of uh, Noah and Enoch and and Abraham and these people there. But obviously, we can't go back there tonight. Uh, you'll be glad to hear. And uh, we leave that. And then you could go on to uh, an examination of, of the rise of the nation of Israel. And that's, as we find that in the, in the Old Testament and then into the New as well. Then God's dealings with them in the Old Testament. And uh, we could then uh, go on to the New Testament, obviously, uh, and study aspects of that there too. And that's, that's being done and is done. Recently, uh, our new minister, Reverend Colin MacLeod, gave us a series of three or maybe four sermons in relation to Paul's first, first missionary journey. Now, we know that he had three missionary journeys, and if it took uh, uh, Mr. MacLeod three or four sermons to get through uh, the first one, uh, you can see there there's lots of scope in that area too. Um, so maybe you can, next time he goes on to doing uh, uh, Paul's second missionary journey, we, we can all uh, turn up with that, with the, the, the first one firmly fixed in our minds. But if it took that long to cover that, then you, we see here we have a huge matter, a huge t um, topic, and a complex one as well. Now, uh, the last time too, I have to run a wee bit of what we did the last time, I was just to pick it up. We, we passed by the history of the early Christian church through the Dark Ages and, and through most of that period there. But it did occur to me today, um, in thinking about uh, bits of this as well, uh, that there were some names that perhaps we didn't mention the last time there, and I thought particularly of um, uh, Bede. You've probably all sometime or other heard of the, the, um, the Honourable Bede. Uh, who was a, a monk in uh, Northumbria, and it would be sometime uh, in the early Middle Ages. You know, we're talking something here about somewhere around about 800 or something like that. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting there because uh, obviously uh, the the Roman Church was. I don't see. I'm not saying Roman Catholic here, but I'm just saying the Roman Church was um, the. The, the main influence um, in certainly in, in the southern part of um, of the, the British Isles at that time there. But remember, we were also talking at one point about the spread um, of the Celts and the way the Celtic Church grew up as well, and uh, and uh, the, the various individuals who were involved in that in that church. Well, these were all there. We're coming now up towards the time. The time I want to talk about is the time, I think it's fair to say, before the disruption. Before the disruption. I don't think uh, I want to get on to the disruption tonight. That's a topic somebody might want to pick up. Uh, and then there's the post-disruption -disrupt church as well. And then there's the post-1900 um, church. Um, so you have a few topics there that you could, if you wanted to, explore at some time um, in the future. One, one, one um, quote uh, that I, uh, or one other point here, is the, the issue of uh, plagiarism. Uh, if you copy something, uh, say you're doing an essay, and you copy something from a source, uh, from a book or from a, a manuscript or whatever it is, uh, if you copy it and you don't acknowledge it, and you just kid on it's your own, then that's plagiarism. But most historians, all historians, use the material of other folk. Obviously, they go back through the material. And 
they're at liberty to use the material and to use the material to prove their own point, whatever point they want to make. That's really what the skill is for, for a historian, is to, as it were, make the case for one particular thing or, whatever, or, or expose the various issues involved in anyway, whatever they happen to be. And uh, so that's really what we're about here tonight. And I'm going to try and use some of the, the sources. When I heard that this was going to be in... Um, uh, something that would be better to do it in, in English, I thought at the time, well, fair enough. And then uh, it occurred to me too that some of the sources that I would use uh, are so well written in the original form. Um, and I, I'll refer to them as we go along just now, uh, very shortly. Some of them were written in English, some of them were written by Gaelic speakers translating their own material into English, and others were written by Gaelic speakers who wrote in Gaelic, and, uh, and of course there were those who were working from English into English. So we had all these issues uh, floating around, as it were, uh, in, the, in, in things. But that's the issue of, um, of plagiarism. I'm, I'm only going to be quoting others here for the, for the, the, the most part. One thing that came, came to mind here, I thought it was quite a, quite a good quote, I think it was in Murdo Macaulay's uh, book on aspects of religious history of Lewis, to which I'll refer a number of times, I hope. Uh, and he was talking about uh, Queen Margaret, who married, remember, probably when you were about that size in school, uh, you would have heard about Malcolm Canmore, or Malcolm Canmore, as the English version went. Uh, he must have had a big head when they were calling him Malcolm Kelmore, surely. But anyway, uh, Malcolm Kelmore uh, married a, a Saxon princess by the name of Margaret. And uh, uh, as it's down in, in, um, in Mordor Macaulay's book, somebody, it wasn't himself, but it was somebody who said, uh, and no offence here to to uh, anybody, <laughs> no offence here to any English ladies, but just, and, and no misogyny implied, but I thought it was quite funny. It said, uh, she was one of these, or one of those strong, interfering, and pious women of whom England has bred a considerable number. <laughs> now, I'm sure we could, we could easily trans translate that into a domestic situation sometimes as well. But anyway, that was Margaret Bent and uh, Malcolm Canmore. Um, to get more back to where we should be though at the moment, on listening to a recording of the previous talk on the subject, I would say it would be fair to say that we had covered a brief outline of matters up to the disruption of 1843. Uh, and that was my intention, was really to resume there. But then, as I read a bit round it, uh, I came to the conclusion, ultimately, that what we might be better to look at would be what they called Konspach Nenjech Bleone. Konspach Nenjech Bleone. That translates into the, um, the Ten Years' Conflict. The Ten Years' Conflict. That would be sort of prior to the disruptions was really a really important time. And uh, uh, Reverend uh, Donald Gillis, Donald MacAleus, who, who was the minister in Crossbost, and you remember, I, I think, I, I, I'm sure I mentioned it last time, that he was instrumental in getting um, a new print of the uh, Shorter Catechism in Gaelic. Uh, uh, on the back of a conversation we had in the, in the middle of Cromwell Street one day and uh, he said to me uh, at the time, he said, uh, uh, when I told him I was having considerable difficulty doing that with the children in the Sunday school, uh, and he said, leave it to me, and, and lo and behold, that came out. He was on something to do with the, the Publications Committee of the Free Church and uh, he was able to do it. A man of his word, a man of action, definitely. And he also produced a book which I've got here, In Yokelish Hur and the Lows. 
Um, and uh, he, um, it's written in Gaelic, obviously, uh, the Free Church in Lewis, and he was taking various aspects of what we're going to talk about tonight and uh, discussing them. And that was, that was um, uh, the thing that leapt out to me, anyway, at the time, was uh, that we could look at this, the Konsbach in the Ten Years' Conflict. And that would be from 1833 up to uh, 1843, that sort of area. Now, to, to back onto that, um, we have to look at a number of things, and I'll just take them as I've got them down here. Um, I've also got uh, the book here by uh, Professor Collins, George Collins, who was a professor in the Church College, and uh, I found his book particularly useful when I was looking at this, and again I thought here, well, why don't we just use the words of the man as it is, rather than uh, me go around simplifying it or explaining it or whatever. Now, um, uh, he spoke about three things that need to be clarified in order to understand the establishment principle. We'll come to the establishment principle uh, in a minute, but in short, the establishment principle was that the state has a duty to support the church. State has a duty to support the church. That was the establishment principle, as I see it anyway. And uh, on that basis, um, if we can look at the, the, there were three sort of attitudes towards that, and Professor Collins and the heritage of our fathers, he raises uh, these points. Now, it's written as a footnote here, and it's quite small, so p forgive me if I'm, if I'm a bit hesitant, hesitant in reading it. But it says, in discussing spiritual independence, that's spiritual independence with reference to the church, uh, and ourselves, of course, as well. Reference has to be made to Erastianism, voluntarism, and the establishment principle. These three things. Erastianism, voluntarism, and the establishment principle. Brief definitions are therefore necessary. Now, the Erastian principle was, Erastianism takes its name from Thomas Erastus who became professor of medicine at Heidelberg, that's in Germany, in 1558. And that's way back, just uh, more or less the time of the Reformation. We, we date the Reformation in Scotland as 1560, but, uh, you know, uh, obviously there, there were things going on a while before that. Erastus had also studied theology. Um, it's quite interesting, a professor of medicine also uh, studying theology, and took a special interest in ecclesiastical discipline. After his death, his views in this connection were developed beyond the limits which he had observed until, in its full-blown form, and this is, the, this is really it, Erastianism came to represent the church merely as a department of the state. The church merely as a department of the state, like, say, the church like um, the health service or the foreign office or whatever it would happen to be, uh, just simply an arm of the state. That's uh, Erastianism. The establishment principle, on the other hand, stresses that the church has a special government of its own. That's really important. Special government of its own into which the civil ruler may not intrude. Church and state are the twin departments of Christ's kingdom on earth, each owing duty and service to the other, and both being concerned with the prerogatives of Christ as head of the church and king of the kings of the earth. The aim of both should be the production and maintenance of a Christian civilization. It is the church's duty to instruct the state in righteousness and, reciproc and reciprocally the state is duty bound to support national religion, although not by 
coercive measures, that is not by interfering, such establishment does not necessarily include endowment. Endowment, that's where, this, where the state actually provides the cash, although support of national religion in this way would have the effect of extending the benefits of the church's ministry even to the poorest regions of the country. So that's, uh, that's the, 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 the issue. The, the key issue in the establishment principle is that it is the church's duty to instruct the state in righteousness and reciprocally the state is duty bound to support national religion although not to not by coercive measures not to interfere um, now you may say well why, why are you going to do all that well that's the core of the whole matter that's what it's all about that's what it's all about uh, in the end of the day this business of disruption and what have you voluntarism now uh, is the, the third uh, uh, theory that comes up and we must, we must air each of these because in actual fact uh, there, there were followers for all three and uh, uh, if you think back to the, to the, 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 the Brexit issue you think back to that as an example um, you had people of, with very strong views you know, for, for Brexit other ones against Brexit, and others who were sort of, as we say, comme you couldn't care less in the middle. Um, but uh, it's the same sort of idea here. Um, you've got very strong views and, and very strong uh, points that, have a, that will have effect later on in the, in the whole show. So uh, this is why it's important to, to hear them. Voluntarism is the flat contradiction of establishment. The absolute opposite. Professor James Bannerman gives a, as the fine, fundamental maxim of the voluntary theory of church and state that, and this is from Professor James Bannerman, the state, as the state, has nothing to do with religion. Dr. James Begg pinpoints the fundamental error of voluntarism where he says it confounds the, the state with the world confounds the state with the world forgetting that civil government is a divine ordinance and not the magistrate is a, is a minister and that the, min, the magistrate is a minister of God unto the people for good I'll read that again for you there because it's quite a complicated thing voluntarism is the flat contradiction the very opposite of establishment Professor James Bannerman gives us as the fundamental maxim of the voluntary theory of church and state that, and this is the quote, the state as the state has nothing to do with religion. Dr. James Begg, uh, obviously an opponent of that, pinpoints the fundamental error of voluntarism where he says, and his quote is, it confounds, it mixes up the state with the world forgetting that civil government is a divine ordinance and that the magistrate is a minister of God unto the people for good. So these are the three, these are the three issues I wanted to, to uh, particularly emphasize here on that and my thanks to Professor Collins for, for doing it. I, I don't think I fancied translating that into Gaelic <laughs> and then having poor Tamat Bugsmuth try and translate it back into English. I think, uh, I think there was a divine inter intervention somewhere along on the back of COVID here. Uh, in, now, in claiming spiritual independence for the church, this is, the, this is the crux of the whole matter. If you get nothing else out of this but that, uh, it's important that we do. People nowadays, for the most part, um, uh, how could you how could you say it? They, they don't they're not concerned with these things they, they're not interested for the most part they don't understand them and uh, they would be floundering around somewhere uh, when you if you were talking about it so in a sense back um, 
uh, historical society are ahead of the game really here in even giving me the chance to, to raise these, these issues here. Because they are the, the background to the whole business of, we, we talk about the Free Church, but the Free Church originally was a much bigger church than it is nowadays. And, but that's another story, we better not go down that, that alleyway just now. It's not an alleyway, it's a motorway. Uh, so we'll keep clear of that for the moment. But just to, to stress that uh, the original Free Church in 1843 was a huge church. In claiming spiritual independence then, uh, for the church, the Disruption Fathers were at pains to show that they were making no new demand they weren't asking for anything new. They were merely restating, reiterating a claim that had been made uh, and upheld time and again ever since the Scottish Reformation, three centuries beforehand. Now, the Scottish Reformation, as I said to you there earlier on, uh, the date that you get as a rule for it, 1560, but obviously uh, that's just a date. Um, it's a wee bit like... Um, it's a wee bit like saying Julius Caesar came to Britain in 55 BC. Well, he probably did come in 55 BC, but who knows, maybe some others came before he came, and maybe lots more came after him. Uh, so from that point of view, you know, that's just a date. It's just a sort of thing to, to hang things on. In a way, 1560 is a date as well that we hang on to. There would have been issues beforehand, and there certainly were, and there were certainly issues afterwards as well. But it had been a claim that was made. Um, they weren't making any new demands. They were simply restating what had been agreed and had been put in statute, actually, by, at the time of the Reformation. And uh, indeed, as Chalmers um, um, pointed out, uh, and this was in relation to the disruption, when he pointed out, when she entered into connection with the state, that's the church, when the church entered into connection with the state, she gave up no part of her liberties. It was her inalienable birthright with which she would not part. She gave up none of her liberties. It was her inalienable birthright with which she would not part. The plan, and this is another quote from Sydney, the plan of a Christian nation had been before the Scottish reformers from the beginning, the likes of John Knox, and at the request of Parliament, they had drawn up their Scots Confession in 1560. That's why 1560 is taken as the date of the Reformation, because of the drawing up of the Scots Confession. What's the Scots Confession? It was a creedal statement, a, a statement. You know, we, we have in, the, in the Christianity and in churches, we have a creed, which is a statement, really, of what we believe. Well, this creedal statement by parliamentary acceptance, and that was important, it was accepted by parliament, it was, um, it was legal, became what was called the National Confession. And its Protestant doctrine was ratified and the church was established as a result of that. Not until, now, now that was in 1560, not until 1567, however, was the church endowed. And I'm going to refer now to um, the heritage of our fathers on this one, and uh, I'll maybe just look at that with you very quickly. I'm seeing the time is starting to go by. And here it is, the, the words I took there originally. The plan of a, Sc a Christian nation had been before the Scottish reformer from the beginning, and at the request of Parliament, they had drawn up the Scots Confession in 1560. This statement, by parliamentary acceptance, became the National Confession. Its Protestant doctrine was ratified, and the Church was established. Not until 1567, however, was the Church endowed. Now, this is what he expands the point here. This is a fact of weighty significance. This is a, a really important matter, for it shows that the Church's claim to spiritual independence was recognised from the very beginning of her existence as an established Church, and that establishment and endowment, that is 
the, the, church, the state providing the cash are not inseparable privileges. In other words, although the, the state is providing, through the establishment principle, providing uh, money to the, to the church, it doesn't in any way put the church in the situation where they are not, uh, they are not free to make their own decisions. The church carried her spiritual freedom into establishment in 1560, and she sacrificed no part of it when she became an endowed establishment in 1567, seven years later. When, therefore, the claim to spiritual independence was made by the Disruption Fathers, that's in uh, 1843, they were at pains to show that it was, a not, it was not something new. Verification of this claim is to be found in the first book of discipline, another foundation document of the church pro produced in 1560, that was at the time of John Knox. There the principle of democratic ecclesiastical government is clearly set forth in the phrase, and this is the phrase, uh, it's probably in medieval type language, but we can still understand it. It appertaineth to the people and to every several congregation to elect their minister. In other words, put it in modern day parlance, it is uh, ev ev everybody in the church, uh, that is uh, every congregation and every group, are free to elect their own minister. And that was, that's the vital principle, that was the whole principle on which the, the disruption actually took place. Very simple, very simple, uh, despite all the, the, the language that surrounds it. When through negligence the congregation failed to exercise the right within a reasonable time, an alternative way of effecting a ministerial settlement might be allowed, but even then the concurrence of the people in the choice of pastor was to be sought, for it was distinctly specified as a thing altogether to be avoided, that any man be violently intruded or thrust upon any congregation. So that was part of the first book of discipline, a very uh, fundamental principle. You can see now when um, Poole's Tramat Burke Smith would be uh, frothing at the mouth by now trying to get to grips with all these terms. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the point that we wanted to make there. There's only another 20 pages, don't worry folks. Now, this one here, I'm watching my time though as it goes by. I'm not going to keep you here till, till uh, 11 o'clock or anything. Reverend Mortimer Macaulay, in his book, Aspects of the Religious History of, of Lewis, refers to the fact that the people of Lewis, and no doubt other areas too, discovered that there were two kinds of preaching. Two kinds of preaching. And um, there was a preaching even of truth that was without unction and without grip. Without unction and without grip. There was another preaching, powerful, because it was full of Christ and full of tender compassion for souls. And Mother Macaulay makes that point very, very clear. Again, another really important thing to grasp. The people heard them, that is the latter group there, those who were powerful because they were full of Christ and full of compassion for souls. The people heard them gladly, hoarded through, hoarded in the danger. The majority of ministers in the Western Isles before 1800 were regarded as belonging to the moderate party of the Church of Scotland. The moderate party were, uh, oh, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's rather long to get into just now. Patrons, that's landowners, had tended to favour the selection of moderates as men of better social class, of more culture, and of less puritanical behaviour. These were the kind of things. Uh, so you'd have a um, you'd have a landowner, and he would he would choose a minister that he thought would be good for the for the place. And uh, it was very often on the basis of that they were of a better social class, they had more culture, uh, they were more learned, and they were less puritanical. A key note to date was the 21st of April, 1824. 
And I want to, this is what I want to do to finish off with actually uh, is this bit on Alexander MacLeod, which is really important, I think. A key date to note was the 21st of April 1824, when Alexander MacLeod was translated to Uig after three years in Cromarty. And according to Reverend Murdo Macaulay's account, and so on page 169, um, that was the case. In 1823, Alexander MacLeod was, through the patronage of Mrs. Stuart Mackenzie, appointed to the vacancy at Uig as a result of the death of the previous incumbent, Reverend Hugh Monroe, who was translated to Uig in 1778. And uh, I want to say a wee bit about that if I can, um, if I can find it in uh, Mr. Macaulay's book, and I'm just going to, as I again say here, I'll go, I'll go to that. Um, and if we look at page 107, I think it is, I have it marked here, yeah. Um, the, the majority of ministers in the Western Isles before 1800 were regarded as belonging to the moderate party of the Church of Scotland. The traditional picture is that the clergymen were in the firm grip of the moderate frost. That's the way it's put there. Patrons tended to favour the moderates because, for the reasons I gave, uh, and they were less concerned with their theology and uh, less concerned with uh, their teaching. Like the other ministers in the island, now this is re in reference to Mr. Monroe, who was in Oog before um, Alexander MacLeod arrived. Mr. Monroe wrote a statistical account of the parish in 1796, and the population had risen from 1,312 in 1755, and it had risen, imagine nowadays, the population of Uig, and then look at these figures, 1,312 in 1755, and now in the year 1796, it was 1,898. He says that in the last few years, great quantities of uncommonly large herring were caught in Loch Rogue. They appeared on the 20th of December and stayed until the middle of January. Food for the winter. Mussels are so plentiful that lime is made of the shells. The kelp of Loch Rogue, 140 tons annually, is superior to any other in the Highland. And this is Mr. Monroe, the, the minister who was giving the account. It was nearly always the minister who gave the account because nobody else could read or write anyway. Um, so there we go, that goes on like that. Uh, Mr. Monroe, in his last years, was very feeble through ill health, asthma, and old age. Um, he was probably quite a nice man. But uh, that's hardly the, the basis of um, being a, a, a minister of the gospel. So he was succeeded at Uig by the Reverend Alexander MacLeod. And uh, Alexander MacLeod, of course, because of his great importance in the whole matter, uh, needs to be coming to this now. This out of the way. Uh, on the back of that there, I wanted just to mention about the sea force that I've taken it with me here, yeah. Uh, Lord, I took these notes from um, uh, Donald MacDonald's book here, this one, Lewis, A History of the Island, a really good book, it's uh, uh, got lots of useful information. And um, Donald MacDonald's book, he was saying, Lord Seaforth, this is just to give you some idea of, of uh, the way things were at the time, Lord Seaforth, Francis, Humbertson Mackenzie, seventh Lord Seaford, eighteen fifteen. He was. He was. This was uh, the annual value of the Lewes returned to Parliament in eighteen forty three, including the fuse in the town of Stornoway, was ten thousand one hundred and ten pounds. That was a lot of money. Ten thousand one hundred and ten pounds was, was quite a lot of money uh, in eighteen forty three. The 1841 census gave a population of 17,037 folk in Lewis. And Lord Seaforth died in 1816. And he was succeeded um, by trustees. But Mr. Stuart Mackenzie was 
was the, his um, son-in-law, and uh, uh, not his son-in-law, but he, um, he w yes, he was. He was his son-in-law. I'm, I'm right. Uh, he was mostly absent, uh, and the affairs were very much in the hands of trustees and the local factor, and uh, they they did absolutely nothing to benefit the tenants. So when Sir James Madison bought the Lewis from the Seaforth family in 1844, he paid £190,000 for Lewis to the Seaforths. And Mr Scobie of Sutherland was appointed factor and under his superintendence began all the um, improvements and expenditure that took, took place. And now uh, coming uh, in, in future from that, of course, I don't want to get into that just now, but then you had the potato famine and all the other things that came on the back of that. But I want to leave that out of it. Sorry? I want to leave that out of it just now and concentrate just on um, on this next bit. Now, Sandra MacLeod was settled in Newig in April 1824. And he was, he was put there uh, with the patronage, with the support of um, Mrs. Stuart Mackenzie. She was Mrs. Hood, um, originally married to Admiral Hood, who was actually uh, a friend of Lord Admiral Lord Nelson. And he died, and then she married this, this um, uh, man who took the name of Mackenzie. Uh, his, his original name was Stuart. And he was from down south, somewhere in Galloway. But anyway, uh, again, there we can we can have a quick look at, at what that says, and I'll just go to it again here. It's it's better put by by Mr. Macaulay than it ever would be by me. In 1823, Alexander MacLeod was, through the patronage of Mrs. Stuart Mackenzie, appointed to the vacancy at Uig. He visited Lewis in January 1824 and wrote to Mrs. Mackenzie on the 5th of February in the following terms. I have heartfelt satisfaction of giving you good tidings of great joy. Through the whole island there is a great thirst for religious instruction and information. He was settled in Uig in April 1824. So this is the start of what we said at the beginning that uh, um, John Gillis has in, in his book here the start of Konspat Nenech Bleone. Konspat Nenech Bleone, the 10 years, the 10 years conflict. And uh, it starts about this time here. You'll be saying to yourself just now, here I hope it's not going to carry on for the, for the next ten years, but uh, this, will, this will come through quickly, I hope. Um, here and there, the Gaelic teachers had been at work for more than ten years, up until the middle, up until the 1770s, 60s or thereabouts there, the Society for the Proper, for the spreading, for the propagation of Christian knowledge, uh, had been sending teachers out, but they weren't allowed to teach in Gaelic. They weren't allowed to teach in Gaelic. When you think of that nowadays, nowadays you, you, you're not allowed to say anything to anybody. Uh, they, can, they can say what they like. Uh, and these days, the, the poor souls who were fluent Gaelic speakers and who could understand nothing else there, and they weren't allowed to, to be taught in anything except a foreign tongue that was being thrust upon them. And the whole idea was, right, we'll make them, we'll make them, civil, we'll civilize them, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll fill them with English and that'll sort it out. That was basically the philosophy be, behind it. Maybe a bit, maybe not quite as crude as that, but it was there. But these Gaelic teachers in the, in the latter part here had been at work, and many of them were, were good men, uh, and uh, they, were, they made a big impression. It was found, it was round Mr. MacLeod's ministry, that the most important occurrences in our religious history took place. Well, that coming here is really important. Here, we're talking about the, the coming of, of um, Christianity to to this particular area here, but I mean, we're talking about the whole island. We're talking about the Western Isles, really. Uh, and Mr. Macaulay is saying here, it was round Mr. MacLeod's ministry 
Alexander MacLeod that the most important occurrences in our religious history took place. Now, another interesting sort of link here is you may have heard of Reverend Norman MacLeod, who was um, a, a very, a very uh, unusual character, a very strong character. Well, Alexander MacLeod was a nephew, if I can remember, I'm just saying this off the top of my head, so I might be wrong, but I, I think he was a nephew of Norman MacLeod. And this Norman MacLeod uh, was a mascent on the other side over here, and uh, he, there's a, a huge story connected with him. Supposing you, if you wanted at any other time to do um, uh, a thing to do with Norman MacLeod um, and any influence he had here, uh, it would certainly be something to consider. Until the, the Edinburgh Gaelic School Society began its work in Lewis, the densest intellectual and spiritual darkness held universal sway in the island, and Oog was no exception. Although the groundwork had begun with these teachers in instructing the people to read the Bible in their own tongue, we hear of no apparent conflict before 1820 after which we noticed some movement among the dry bones through the preaching and evangelical zeal of individuals such as Finlay Monroe and John MacLeod of Galson. Before Mr MacLeod was settled in Uig, it was reported that when he would come, he would not baptise a single child unless the parents were exemplary in conduct and stood in searching examination in scripture teaching. The entire parish discussed the situation and all the parents crossed the moor to Harris with their unbaptized children uh, and Mr Bethune, the minister in Harris, sprinkled them without much bother. When Mr MacLeod landed in Stornoway on his way to Uig, he was accosted by that stalwart Christian, Murdoch MacDonald. Now, Murdoch MacDonald was known as Murdoch Moor Mingras, Grass, big Murdo of, of, or Murdo of the Great Grace. And Murdo had been converted while listening to one of the Gaelic teachers reading Boston's Fourfold State. He, he bluntly asked Mr. MacLeod when he came, uh, where he came from, to which Mr. MacLeod replied, who gave you authority to catechize, to catechize me? In other words, to question me. Murdo replied, the Holy Spirit. Oh, as said Mr. MacLeod, said Mr. MacLeod, oh, if that's the case, I came from store in Ascent. That's the reference to Norman MacLeod as well. There I was born and brought up. I have been a minister in Dundee and in Cromarty, and I am on my way to be the minister of Uig, where I hope to preach the gospel in its glory and wonder. Morning Grass replied, it is sorely needed there, for there is not a soul in that parish who knows anything about it except one haired laddie, and they think he is stark mad. The haired laddie referred to is supposed to have been Malcolm McRitchie, who later became the minister of Knock. In 1818 there were only two Bibles in Uig, one in the church and one in the manse. Imagine. That year, and this is the Malcolm Akritchi, the, the haired laddie. Um, that year, Malcolm Akritchi got a loan of a New Testament in, in Gaelic from a friend in another part of the island, along with Baxter's call to the unconverted. Through reading these, these uh, uh, books, his conscience was pricked, but he had no one to guide him in the fountain of salvation. He had a great desire to procure a complete Gaelic Bible. Now, the Gaelic Bible uh, was, was uh, a huge step forward that would, would merit a, another, another time as well. In 1820, he heard, uh, this is important, he heard it was on sale in Stornoway. So he travelled the 30 miles across the moor, there was more than 30 miles, across the moor to procure one. When he arrived, he discovered that the price was five shillings, that was a lot of money then, a sum which he did not possess. So he had to return home without it. Shortly after this, he salvaged a cask of palm oil on the shore 
and having reported this to the custom house in Stornoway, he received five shillings for it. He immediately set off again for the Bible and duly returned with a desired treasure. This was in 1821, but before that, Mr. McCritchie or the haired laddie had obtained another treasure, even in the forgiveness of his sins. News of the Bible soon spread and the neighbours gathered to hear him reading it. Mr. Monroe, the minister, this is the minister who was there before Norman MacLeod, uh, for, for Alexander MacLeod, I should say. Mr. Monroe, the minister, was not too pleased when he heard this and he threatened to remove Mr. McCritchie's father from the glebe land as he was the minister's man. The father replied, you can take the land from me, but you can't take grace from Malcolm. When Malcolm was under conviction, he went to the manse to see if he would get some comfort from Mr. Monroe, who was a moderate, remember, but when he went a second time, all the doors were locked and the maids were all peeping out through the windows, terrified, as Mr. Monroe had told them, that Malcolm was insane. In 1823, at the age of 20, McCritchie taught at Aline and Lochs, and a work of grace began among the people there. Night and day, children, parents, and even grandparents attended his school together. He used to say in later years that he would have been happy if he had, if he had seen as much fruit in his labours in the three congregations of which he was a minister as he had seen in that small township of Aline. Whatever hopeful impressions were made on Mr. MacLeod's mind during his visits to Lewis, in January, 20, in January 1824, as soon as he was settled in Newark, he was made suddenly aware of the stark reality of the darkness that prevailed in his new charge. However strange it may appear to us now, when he held his first prayer meeting in Newark, he was shocked to hear one of the, one of the former of the former elders of the congregation on whom he had called to pray, beseeching the Almighty in the following terms, O Lord, thou knowest that we have come a long way to this meeting. We have put ourselves to a good deal of trouble, and we hope that thou wilt reward us for it by causing some wreck on the shore on our way home. Another requested God to grant them a large catch of cod and ling, in return for their good service in attending the meeting today, while still another spoke of the death of our Lord as a great calamity. It's wa du gingu and wa vasik krius, that it's a, it's a black day for us, the day that Christ died. MacLeod said, sit down man, sit down, you've said enough. After the Sabbath service, he was appalled to discover that whisky and tobacco were being sold outside the church, even on the Lord's Day, and this abuse he attacked at once. And so on it goes. Um, now, I'm, I'm conscious that we've been going for nearly an hour and I need to stop, but uh, I think you can see where, where things are going. There was one very interesting bit that I wanted to share with you, and that was... Um, um, when Dr. MacDonald came uh, to preach uh, in New I don't know if I'll be able to find it now, but uh, I'll finish off what I'm saying here anyway. I think I've covered most of it, actually. Uh, we mentioned Malcolm McCritchie. Uh, oh, I, when, when uh, Mr. MacLeod came to me, Mr. MacLeod did not hold the sacrament in the summer of 1824, but postponed it for a year. At the end of the year, he postponed it for another year, claiming, as we shall see from, from his letter to Mrs. Mackenzie, that he had in the parish no sacramental tables or cloth. That was just an excuse. He realised realized that they were coming to the Lord's table and they hadn't a clue what they were doing. They were absolutely ignorant. And uh, there were lots of them. Um, it was more or less uh, something that just happened. You just, you just went whenever you reached a certain age. The postponement for a second year of the sacrament raised a storm, and Mr. Cameron in Stornoway, who had been inducted there in 1825, decided to send a bag of tokens to the Ewing communicants through a messenger. Ward reached Mr. MacLeod of this, and he consulted MacRamore, who was one of his teachers in 1825, MacRamore the minister, who he wasn't a minister at this stage. And 
Francis McBean, who had also been a teacher, but was now, uh, after being an inspector of schools, acting as a road contractor and school builder. So Francis McBean was clear of the of the of the, the clear of the presbytery. As the parish schoolmaster, Macrae was under the jurisdiction of the presbytery, so he his hands were tied. But McBean was not. So it was agreed that Mr. McBean should deal with the matter of the tokens. He met the man uh, coming from Stornway with the tokens, with a fierce and sudden demand, uh, the tokens are your life. So the man quietly handed over the tokens, and that was it. Uh, and the tokens never arrived in Uig. MacLeod was called to task at the next presbytery meeting, not only for the action taken to keep the tokens from the people, but also for his disturbing sermons. MacLeod refused to keep the sacrament and was sentenced to a year's silence for contumacy. contumacy. MacLeod stated at the presbytery that it mattered not what they would say or do to him, as long as he had the Lord on his side. The term he used for the Lord was the minister more Minister Moore, remember he was talking in Gaelic here. So he said, Fatsav is a Minister Moore in Mahiv, Simpson of Lochs, another of the, the, the moderates, who was a giant of a man, was in the chair, and he thought Mr. MacLeod was talking about him as the Minister Moore. So taking this as a compliment, he blurted out, That's right, Mr. MacLeod, I'm with you, and we shall defy them. And then he pronounced the benediction, and the matter ended. This would be closed. It may, may appear difficult to explain the spiritual des desolation in Lewis at the time and the darkness that prevailed in Uig in particular, especially when we remember that a stated Protestant had for a considerable time uh, been settled among the people. The answer is that the Lewis ministry was not an evangelical one, for modernism had held sway. A secular, selfish indifference to the eternal interest of souls, with its blighting effects on the moral and religious nature uh, and su suspectabilities of men, was the fruit thereof. Now, the one other thing I wanted to mention was the time, if I can find it, when uh, uh, let's see. A note, the, the, the movement of the movement at Uig, Professor George Smeaton said that it was of the purest, one of the pure, most pure revivals he had ever heard of in the Church of Scotland, uh, unless the awakening in Aran surpassed it in freedom from wildfire and fanaticism. A note of the mystery of providence regarding Dr. MacDonald, this is Dr. MacDonald Ferentosh, a rival at Uig is worthy of our place as we deal with Mr. MacLeod's first communion. In April 1827, Dr. MacDonald uh, was on his way to St. Kilda. Dr. MacDonald was unable to land in St. Kilda because of stormy weather. In June, he tried again. After being driven back twice, the workmen having gone on, they were going to build a church. And that was the whole idea. Dr. MacDonald was accompanied by his second son and left home on the 2nd of July, 1827. Coming to Brackadill and Skye on the 16th, he sailed for St. Kilda on the 17th, getting as near as 15 miles to the island and was forced to turn back to Harris. After remaining for some days due to the adverse weather, he decided to cross over from Harris to Uig. Mr. MacLeod had given him a pressing invitation to assist at his communion on the 24th of June. On the 22nd, he and his son set out with a guide and staff in hand and arrived at the Udmans on Saturday, the 23rd, at 11 a.m. Mr. MacLeod was in a weak state of health at the time, and Dr. MacDonald preached on Saturday, Sabbath forenoon, and on Monday. The number present on Sabbath was not under 7,000, and the doctor says that the occasion was a season of awakening of some and of refreshing to others. When Dr. MacDonald arrived in Uig on Saturday, the people were not aware of his presence until he appeared in the preaching box. Mr. MacRae, Parvis, who was a moderate, of course, was expected to take the service. This is, no, this is showing you the difference, if you like. 
uh, in, in the two styles. Mr. McCray Barvis was expected to take the service, and some did not expect very much from him. It was said that one of the godly teachers from Ascent, Mordo Mackenzie, who at the time uh, was at the time in Laxey, was so displeased that Mr. William was to preach on Saturday. That's on the Mr. McCray, the, uh, the Barvis minister that without absenting himself, he went behind the preaching box with his back to it. So he couldn't see who was, who was actually in the preaching box. When the psalm was given out, he said, you cannot spoil that on me anyway. Then came the prayer, and as Mr. Mackenzie listened, he said, pity him who says that Mr. William has no grace. As the prayer continued, he said, if I have grace myself, so has Mr. William. As the doctor still continued, he said, I swear that Mr. William has grace. This was the doctor's first service in Lewis, and one wonders what Murdo Mackenzie had to say by the time Mr. MacDonald had finished on Monday. On Tuesday, Mr. MacDonald and his son retired to Harris, returned to Harris, but they were not able to land on St. Kilda until the 9th of July, and so on it goes. Well, I may think you can hand over or shall it? But these are just uh, some instances of um, what is to be to be gleaned, if you like, here. But that's the, the story uh, as it goes there. Uh, the ten years prior, the ten years prior to the actual um, disruption and uh, what was taking place in Lewis, and particularly the Oog situation, because that had that had a great uh, deal to do with the, the actual disruption. Now. Uh, if you wanted to pa carry on from there, you'd have to then um, build on, on the basis of what we've spoken about tonight. But we've spoken about all the, the different issues that were around at the time. So I hope uh, uh, that has cast some light on things for you. It certainly uh, opened my eyes to a number of things. But um, uh, we have no choice now but to stop. So. Uh, I thank you for listening. Thank you for turning out on such a Michal or night. I've been asked to propose a vote of thanks, and uh, I have no difficulty in doing that because I could add everything historical to understand where we are or what we are. We have to understand what we have come from, and this has added to it. A thought came to me that when we get the new port to government, which hopefully before the end of the summer we have, uh, this would make for a very good uh, discussion, discussion uh, session uh, lasting over a few months there. And uh, if, if not, that Ian could be back, going back once every year, uh, <laughs> as, long as, as he is able to continue uh, this. A couple of things that, that he said there. Uh, if the weather of Norman MacLeod, of Assad is the Norman MacLeod, I am thinking of, that would be the one who would take Brechton, then to Australia, and then to New Zealand. Well, four years ago just now, I had the privilege of appear at the church that he established in Waipu in New Zealand, and standing at his grave uh, there in Waipu as well. And there's another island connection with Waipu as well. I don't know if you know to Alistair Smith from Kios, from, uh, who's an elder in the Church of Scotland in uh, Kinloch, or his uh, brother, the Reverend Angus Smith, who was the, yeah. the minister of the Church of Scotland and chaplain to the army yeah. and not see. But the Reverend Lieutenant Commander Alexander MacDonald was then the minister of that church in Waipu at the beginning of the last century, and he was their uncle. Uh, and so so that, was very, that was very, very interesting also. And another one, uh, uh, less edifying maybe, is that when you mentioned uh, MacDonald, Dr. MacDonald, Donald Natoshi, I've also had the privilege to stand at the place where they now hold a service every year outside an outdoor one. And that land on which it was a big hollow, uh, and, and there's actually a, a kind of a wee coop in there where, where they hold this, uh, uh, stands for the land of the, of the, of the Getty family. And there's a lady I speak to every day on the radio, and her married name is Morak Del Getty. And that was my hostess, it's on the land, her father and lost land, that, 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 that's there, and the land on which Nono of the Toshi uh, used to have, the, have, the, have all his open air services, and they still hold one every year. That's just in the path of two thoughts that came to me as you, as you were doing that. Most interesting, indeed, 
uh, and very important for our common ethnicity that we know all these things in relation to the wider and uh, more specific area of uh, uh, interest to, our, to ourselves. And uh, on behalf of the common ethnicity, uh, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Before everyone goes out into the storm again, our um, next meeting is in, in uh, March, and hopefully it's going to be a local archaeologist, Ian McCarty, who led all the walks in the summertime. We had nine dry, beautiful sunny days last summer, and lots of people to part in the walks. So Ian McCarty will be um, in March. And towards the end of April, there's going to be a book launch of a book um, booklet produced by the community commemorating the centenary of the establishment of the villages of Conwaloch and Grace, um, a group um, on the committee from the two villages have been working on the booklet, and it's just about to be to go to the printers actually. So look out for details of the book launch. Uh, who is the last the last Friday <coughs> Yes, yes. So we look forward to seeing you all sometime. Sorry. The building at the Porter Cabin, yes, we have with um if you remember uh, I'm going to talk about time in lockdown. It was like two years ago. Yeah. We got the, the Crown Estate funding, and we have now ordered a modular building to go up in the old school site. Um, the deposit has been paid, the building has been ordered, and all being well, as Kenneth kind of mentioned, it will be there in the summertime. So that's really exciting, and it'll give us a base to work from and be able to meet people and uh, store artefacts. Um, I've not mentioned any names of the artefacts. Store artefacts um, and uh, documents and just, just get on with stuff. Because it's been difficult without having a, a base to work from. So it's all good, it's all positive. And a huge thanks to our councillors for the help they've given us support in reaching the state and to the public as well for all your support. So see you all soon again.